Hey, remember Andy Swift? Yeah, the cybersecurity whiz I interviewed recently for my Getting Into Cybersecurity series. If you missed that one, seriously, what are you doing? Go check it out. Now here's the fun part. Andy and I, we go way back, like a whole decade back in the UK where we tore through some epic pen tests together. And when I say epic, I mean stories you still remember a decade later kind of epic. We actually started telling those stories at the end of that interview, but I had to cut them out. Why? Well, because that video was already getting far too long and I didn't want people to miss out on them. That's why you're here though, right? This video is all about diving into those wild tales. Picture this, 15 minutes of Andy and I talking through some fun pen testing stories from the good old days. Want to know how a cow schooled Andy on XSS? Or why you should never, and I mean never, underestimate a printer? What about how knowing even some basic coding skills can turn the tide in any pen test? Intrigued? Well, buckle up, because it's almost story time. Oh, and just when I thought we were done, Andy hit me up when I was editing and said, Hey man, that was fun. We should do this more often, podcast style. And that got me interested. What do you all think? Would you tune in for a podcast where Andy and I, maybe with a guest or two, share more of these cybersecurity war stories? Let me know in the comments. If enough of you are into it, we may just kick off a whole new series. As always, if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Now, without further ado, let's jump into these pen testing stories. Are there any memorable stories you want to reminisce about from our old days of testing? <laughs> No, I think we're done. To finish there, let's uh, stop being embarrassing. No, there's loads of loads of stories. I was trying to write a few down earlier because we did have some good times. I've got three written down, which I really enjoyed. One of them showcases you as being pretty amazing as well. So, well, there we go. Let's let's open with that one. <laughs> I'll leave that one off. Yeah, uh, I'll leave that one because it is quite funny, and I feel very sorry for the client actually <laughs> after watching the rest of them. Um, <laughs> uh, so the, the first one was my cross-site scripting cow incident. Which... Ah, yes. This <laughs> is good. I love this one. I've been teased about this for many years, uh, but there's a very serious learning from it and side to it as well, for, especially for web app testers out there, for, for sure. <laughs> Expect to be unexpected is a lesson. So what I mean by cross-site scripting cow is we were testing an application and I found a reflective cross-site scripting uh, bug, which is pretty cool. I did the standard sort of like, JavaScript pop up. I just go, yeah, I was like, that's pretty boring. I'll just inject a picture. Why not? Doesn't matter. It's reflective. Who cares? It's just happened in my, my end. I, I didn't get it. So I, I put a picture of a cow in there and just, and then I tapped you on the shoulder. I went, ha, look what we've done. We put a cow on the page. <laughs> I probably it's rolled my cool. eyes and then laughed. And then, yeah, that's pretty good. All right. <laughs> yeah. We carried on with what you were doing. Oh, very good, Andy. And it was all very funny because it was, you know, it was reflective and it was, it was done, dusted, didn't expect any sort of comeback from it at all. And then the next day, our manager was like, did you inject a cow into the, and we were like, uh, how do you know? Like I'm screenshotting it as like an achievement of putting a cow and sticking that in a report. We're like, how did you find out about this? It's like, well, the client's been on the phone. And um, it, I should say this is very, very early in my pen testing career. I was very, very junior at this time. Um, <laughs> and what he said was like, yeah, they've got this cow popping up all over the backend admin system. So it turns out there was a completely separate application. It wasn't even the backend for the same application. It was a completely separate application that created logs from their various applications that they developed. And it turns out these logs were like completely injectable. <laughs> So what I thought was a reflective cross-site scripting bug in this one site was actually a stored bug in another system entirely that was just logging things like post requests, which was hilarious. Uh, and that's all it did, because it just it just logged and they could just view the post request. But yeah, it popped up cows all over the place. But yeah, the, the interesting take from that is, I mean, don't always assume. Uh, don't always assume there's just one side to an exploit. And it's, there's always the potential there could be a back-end system somewhere to test. And it turns out, like, I mean, you can imagine the damage that would do, right? A, a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability on an yeah. administrative logging panel. Like, you just imagine what you could do with that in terms of, like, cookie extraction and stuff. It's just, it's, it's not even worth thinking about. It's mental. There, so, actually, yeah, there are actually payloads and sites now that will, like, trigger. They won't load a cow, but they will, they will issue a, a request. <laughs> to uh, an external mm -hmm. server that you control to let you know, hey, mm -hmm. this triggered somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Server, ser I think, I, be I believe it's, yeah, so it is technically persistent, but when it's sort of blind like that, it's more, 
it's either blind XSS or server side XSS. It, it depends on how loose you want to be with the terms. But yeah, it's basically you inject it in one application, it somehow makes it to some back end system, and that's where it's exploited, which is, yeah, it's, it's more fun with a cow, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely more fun with a cow. But yeah, a, a big, big learning point there for, for me in terms of how applications fit together and stuff like that. So yeah, there's an educational side to this too. This was a funny one. But we, we also found similar things in, a, in like mobile applications as well. So mobile applications also have a web application counterpart to them. Same yeah, thing. a lot of the time. You, know, you might be able to inject something into the mobile application that it does nothing. And you're like, oh, great. But then you can load up the actual web version of it and you're like, oh, my God, there's cross site scripting all over the place. So, yeah, always always look at those two different viewpoints, I guess. Um, I'll, go on to, I'll go on to the second one. I've, I've titled this one Solicitor Printer Hack. Does ring bells for you? Vaguely, vaguely, but I, yeah, you'll you'll have to explain it. I'll probably I'll probably twig early on, but yeah, a good one. Uh, you're probably lost in the corridor. <laughs> um, we'd gone to a large solicitors in London, very big open plan office. It was lovely. Uh, we were getting nowhere actually in it, and it was one of those times as a pen tester you go on site to an internal Windows based networking and you're like. Oh my God, are we actually going to, has a client done a really good job here and hard and everything and we're not going to get anywhere? Is this really a thing? Because we had a stupid rule at one point. It's like, we're not going to go to lunch till we get domain admin. We should... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like three, four o'clock going, really getting hungry quite now. hungry, yeah. <laughs> we're so close, damn it. Um, <laughs> and, and this one was really cool because we, we noticed out of the corner of our eye there was a printer station in the corner of this office and there was an actual full-blown operating system, Windows operating system on it. And it turns out these printers were connected to the domain as well. So we're like, screw it. We've got like actual live access to this printer and people are literally going up to it and like doing stuff with it, putting usernames in and passwords to print stuff. We're like, we'll just key log the printer. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> It turns out the only reason we got a domain admin was because we managed to start the path of compromise from the printer we had a key locker on, uh, of all things. And yeah, it, it just escalated from there. And it was a really cool uh, route to compromise. But just another learning objective from this one, I guess, don't count anything out on internal, just because it's hardware, just because it's not obviously immediately part of the network and it's sat there in the corner of a room doing stuff. Yeah, it's all fair game, isn't it? IP yeah, phones. I do remember that one now. That was good. <laughs> that was a fun one. Yeah, I, I also remember when we did an internal and there was uh, the only thing we managed to break into is the, well, there were loads of things, but the, the main thing that amused us for hours on end was with the canteen screens. That yes. Um, <laughs> change what we're they had, the they had VNC running on them and it was like you would like, yeah. you'd literally VNC into them and just see the canteen menu and it was like, what? <laughs> Why could I be in C into this? <laughs> Don't find You know, we'll have fish and chips instead. Let's just change that. Uh, <laughs> it's a great day. We had a great lunch that day. Um, <laughs> brilliant. And my my final one, and it, it, yeah, hats off to your work on this. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll end on a complimentary note. You know, obviously, Heartbleed. And yes. I remember. We were. It, it was a. It was a check job there in the morning, and this this client had gone out of their way. But it was a one of those annual clients that comes about year after year, and, and we had. It was, it was like our second year of testing them, I think, and they were. It's one of the rare occasions where clients actually read reports uh, and action them, uh, and they were like super happy that they had fixed everything. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we've done a good job here. We've we've read your report last time, implemented all the fixes. We're good to go here. We sat down and did the pen test, and I think I don't know if you or I was one of us was reading the news from like the night before, and like, oh my god, this thing called Heartbleed exists now. It's, it's literally Which, like for those before. for those who are unaware, because this is ancient now, but it was a it was a massive vulnerability in OpenSSL, which basically meant you could leak memory just by connecting, just by setting up an initial open like SSL connection, you could leak memory. But it was it was crazy at the time. Because mm. it left no trace either, did it? 
Yeah. Uh, no. So <laughs> it's a case of run it, and there's literally no forensic evidence for nope. anything to say that it had been targeted. And um, there's a there's a good learning point out, out of this as well about crafting tools and things. I'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, it was literally the in the night before that vulnerability was released. It was like, oh my god, got there in the morning. There weren't really many scripts that have been posted, weren't too many proof of concept scripts, and you literally wrote a, an exploit for it um, whilst we were on site for this for this client. And they, we were like, yeah, compromised everything. We're like, what? <laughs> yeah, well, there's this, new, there's this new exploit last night. <laughs> Sorry. Again, if that hadn't happened, uh, we wouldn't have got so far in the network. Yes, yeah, I, I forget you know? what we... I think, yeah, well, I think the memory could include like HTTP requests, but also I think we managed to get cookies out of that. I think there was potentially potentially we got actual hashes or like credentials mm. out of out of some machines as well, which is crazy. It was yeah, it was insane. But yeah, that that was that was a huge vulnerability at the time, and yeah, the, just just being able to code a script. I think what I what I did was I took a script that like it was a proof of concept. So in 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 the in the SSL message, you configure what the supported ciphers were, and they had just mm. they had just I think taken like a default set and coded those in, and I was like, well, there's no there's no actual reason why you just not put all the ciphers in there, like literally, because it's just an ID, it's just a number. But I just like coded it so it would say, hey, I support all these ciphers, and yeah, it would it would end up actually working against more systems than the proof of concept. Some of the proof of concept just didn't work, which is great. But yeah, that was that was a fun one. I I do enjoy that one. A really nice entry point into things like exploit development as well. By the way, mm -hmm. is to is modifying proof of concept code because proof of concept code out of the box is always very more often than not very limited in, in what it can do. And nine times out of ten, one of my favorite things to do at the moment is expand on what those proof of concept code exploits do. Like, for example, you, you take the heart peak form, for example. It, yes, it does need memory, but you've got to have a method of extracting stuff and searching for interesting artifacts in memory. So mm -hmm. you, you might build a tool that can build on that, that does for memory extraction, but it also searches for things like authentication cookies or anything like that, it, but it might be lurking in memory and extract those in a nice, neat table, for example. And there's loads of cases of this sort of stuff in one of the, the team city exploits i was talking about earlier was one we were working on a little while ago and that was announced last year i think at the tail end of last year maybe time moves too quick <laughs> but uh, again one of the, the proof of concepts that came out of the early ones were very kind of limited in what they what they could do and what they could extract and i remember one of the proof of concepts was yeah you could you could submit this specific api call and you could run a command and it's like just a single command though on, on the host operating system, which is great if you want to run the word host name or who am I mm -hmm. or something like that. If you want to do anything more advanced, like chain a couple of commands together, I don't know, the proof of concept wouldn't work. So even if you're rewriting somebody else's proof of concept code to handle stuff like that, it encode a bunch of commands so you can actually chain stuff together properly, maybe. Like any of those sorts of things gets you on your road to pull on exploit development or yeah. gets your sort of foot in the door to go, these are the tools I've created when you're at interview, here's a nice list of them. And yeah, I think that puts you in really good stead. It's a really, really cool way in. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you get that sense of achievement very early on from doing stuff like that. So yeah. And then it's like shell shot came like a year later and we were like, oh, this is even better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we, uh, we got so many systems through shell shock. It was a layer like for a whole like two months before it was massively patched out. It was like every single CGI server just fell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love those sort of pivotal industry moments where something happens and everyone's like, oh my God. I love yep. Log4j as well. I mean, that was, yep. that was fun yep. for a while, wasn't it? It's like, oh my god, everyone's going down. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's that, that existed. And uh, there's also that backdoored version of SSA from them not so long ago as well. Yeah. Absolute disaster. But yeah, just one of those things. That, that was actually one of my favourite kind of social engineers in recent times, I think. It's like the king of social engineering. But yeah, it was interesting. And when those sorts of big things do happen, that's where where your experience comes in to be able to handle them and patch them and make proper recommendations to your clients to go yeah this bug is out there mm. but nine times out of ten you know when these bugs hit the thing that saves most people is good configuration 
good base configuration. Yeah. But we always have a fun saying, which is like, if you're relying too much on stuff to put in front of your service, firewalls, web application firewalls, all that sort of stuff, and you don't actually have the web application underneath hasn't been written well enough in the first place to uh, filter out stuff, uh, that's a problem. Uh, if you have a good level of configuration on the server, a good hardening, and you're just putting a firewall in front of it, it things should be able to work without those lovely things in front of them. They should yeah. just be bulletproof from the get-go. Then anything else you put in front of it is like a cherry on the cake, and a little bit of icing, and that works really well. Yeah, so build up those, build up that contextual knowledge, and you can help your clients with so many avenues rather than just black and white answers. It really does help. Really does help. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you enjoyed the stories, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. And remember, let me know in the comments if a podcast with Andy sounds like something you tune in for. See you next time.